Well, welcome everybody. I think technically we still have one minute left, but why waste a minute? Um, my name is Jonathan Brown. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. Uh, thanks very much for coming. We're very, uh, we're delighted and honored to have our guest today for the last minute uh, talk on a very uh, germane issue. Uh, Ambassador Barbara Bodine was, is a distinguished professor since July. She's come to Georgetown University, distinguished professor in the practice of di diplomacy and is the director of the Institute of the, for the Study of Diplomacy in the School of Foreign Service. And uh, she, like some professors at Georgetown, but I think more than most of them, she has an extensive career in, as a practitioner, 33-year career in the Foreign Service, where she was the ambassador twice to Iraq. Ambass no, I, I served in Iraq. Twice served, I served twice in Iraq, once in Kuwait. And most recently was the ambassador to Yemen from 1997 to 2000, most of 2001. And since then, she's been, we were just discussing this, she's been working her way up to Georgetown, starting out at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where she was founding director of the Kennedy School. And uh, also then at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, at Foreign, for International Affairs at Princeton University. And then finally, she made it to Georgetown, just recently, so we're very happy. Uh, and she's also a former uh, regent of the University of California board, mm -hmm. which is always in the news. Yep. And, uh, and a graduate of University of California, Santa Barbara, Yay. which was it's a very nice place. If you ever manage to get a trip there for some reason or the other, enjoy. So she'll be speaking today about Yemen. And uh, she'll speak, hopefully, for uh, enough time for us to get what we need and what she wants to say, and then for us to be able to answer, ask the questions we have. But thanks very much. Please go ahead. Thank you. And I wasn't the founding director of the Kennedy School, just the governance initiative at, at the Kennedy School. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure who did found the Kennedy School, but it was even before my time. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I was, I must have misunderstood that, because I thought Kennedy you School know, was a little older. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'll go, go back and look at that and make sure. It, so anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, yes, and I'm delighted to be here this afternoon to see such interest in um, Yemen, a otherwise sometimes obscure country. Uh, and I'm certainly delighted to be here at, at Georgetown. Um, this has been, um, I'm, I couldn't be happier. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to talk to you about this odd country called Yemen. Um, Fortunately, that is an accurate map. There's an older version, and so I appreciate that. Um, and I'll try to get, I've been working on Yemen since I was a junior officer, um, and continue to work on it. And I actually used to teach a 13-week class on it at my previous place of employment. So I'm going to try to get this down to about half an hour, um, I'm, which means I'm going to skip lightly over a couple of issues and, and ideas, and I will leave it to you to ask questions uh, and, um, and, and seek some clarification. Um, Yemen's politics um, are always kaleidoscopic. Uh, there's a finite number of players uh, that seem to be able to array themselves in an infinite number of patterns. There are endless combinations, endless coalitions, uh, and to the outside world, and I would probably say to the Saudis, but to the outside world, these ever-shifting patterns seem random and chaotic and, and certainly are very confusing. Um, and they can seem like that within Yemen as well, although to Yemenis, the dynamics, uh, the patterns are perhaps a little bit more apparent. Uh, Professor Vol, when we were talking a little bit before this, I uh, was just asking, well, who are their grandparents? Uh, and in Yemen, that's a very basic and important question. Uh, they know the connections in ways that, that we can never hope to. As a sidebar on that, I was at a, a woman's, uh, the woman's part of a Yemeni wedding, 800 women at this, this, this thing. Um, all of them were Irianis. And um, I said, well, you know, how are you, you know, do you all know how you're related? Are you all related to each other? Yes. Do you know how? Yes. 
Um, I don't know about you, but I don't think there are 800 Bodines in the United States, and if there are, I have not a clue as to how I'm related to them. <laughs> um, Yemenis do. They know how they're related to virtually everybody in this country of 25 million. And so therefore, they can watch the patterns and understand them far better than we can. What is important for us to bear in mind um, is that these shifting patterns have been going on for a very long time. They're not a product of the Arab Spring. They're not a product of either the end of the Cold War or the start of the Cold War. They have really almost nothing to do with the global war on terrorism. They literally go back generation upon generation. And even the most illiterate Yemeni can tell you not just who his grandfather is, but can go back eight to 10 generations. I don't know the names of all of my great grandparents. Uh, it was something the Yemenis could never understand. Um, those who think, particularly like us, in far more constrained timelines, uh, miss the depth and complexity of these patterns at our peril. And when we try to impose solutions uh, based on our timelines, uh, we're operating not just at our peril, but at Yemen's peril. Uh, this is a country that thinks in 4,000 year increments. Uh, we think in maybe two or three year increments. It doesn't work very well. Um, the story of Yemen um, and this kind of shifting patterns and what it means to us um, actually predates 1001 Arabian Nights and there's a story in there, not one of the biggies, um, about a king of Yemen and he has three sons and this being Yemen they're very quarrelsome uh, they're all vying and jockeying for position and power and the king does everything he can to try to get you know his sons to to reconcile and work together and of course they won't so he sends them off on a quest and he says whoever brings me back the, the greatest gift you know will have my throne <coughs> and what's interesting is this has got a little bit of a creation story element to it the sons go off in three different directions one heads south into Africa to the east coast of Africa one heads kind of east <coughs> into uh, Indonesia and, and those archipelagos over there and up into Central um, Asia. And then the other one heads up the Red Sea and, and into the Levant and North Africa. That is exactly the migration pattern of the Yemenis over millennia. Um, of course, at a certain point, all the sons come back. They each think that they've got the greatest gift. And what they discover is of course their father is sick and the kingdom is under peril. And only by bringing all of their gifts together and working in unison can they save their father's throne, save the state. There's a lot of stories about Yemen in that tale. Um, I, I don't know of another country it could be written about. To also kind of give you an idea about how long this, this idea of, of inner turmoil goes, the story has it that Cain and Abel um, are buried in Yemen. So <laughs> this idea of a little bit of turmoil, a little bit of friction, um, is a very old one. Yemen has also always has been the always almost failing state. And it has been the always almost failing state for as long as I have been working on it. Um, at the same time, it's also managed to be Arabia Felix, which means happy Arabia. And somehow it's managed to do both of those at the same time. Um, it is, sorry, um, it has deep ties across the Red Sea, um, and it's been constrained and both protected by geography. Uh, Yemen grew and evolved largely on its own, uh, connected by trade, we're talking about the three sons heading out connected by trade, but at the same time secure behind mountains, uh, the empty quarter, and, and the ocean. And as a result, um, Yemen rarely fits the templates uh, that we tend to create for the rest of the region, whether or not they fit the rest of the region. It do, they don't fit the templates for the peninsula, they don't fit the templates for the rest of the Arab world, they don't fit the templates for the Horn of Africa. And anybody who's worked on Yemen for a very long time, at, certain, at a certain point when you're trying to figure out what's going on, 
you finally come down to the irreducible, it's just Yemen. Um, another basic truth uh, before we get into current events is that despite geography and despite a dearth of resources, and Yemen has virtually none of any kind, uh, Yemen has also played host to other people's proxy battles over the millennia. Most recently, it was a proxy battle between Nasser's uh, Arab socialism and the Saudi royalists. Uh, it was a proxy battleground for us and the Soviet Union. It was obviously a proxy battleground for the war on terrorism that's still going on. And now the most current um, intra-regional uh, competition between the Saudis uh, and the Iranians. So the geography has not been a pure uh, blessing to them. And then finally, just a few facts about Yemen. Um, it's the largest country in the Arabian Peninsula. It's about the size of Texas or France, depending on your frame of reference. It's the most populous, at about 25 million and rapidly growing. Um, it's got a population equal to the rest of the peninsula combined, uh, notwithstanding what the Saudis claim is their population, which nobody believes. Um, it's also the youngest in a region known for its youth bulge and the youth bomb and everything else that we've heard since the Arab Spring. Uh, the Yemen population is by far the youngest. It is at least 60 percent under the age of 25, possibly more. Um, that also means that they, they have not even really hit their baby boom. Uh, it's still coming. It is, oddly enough, given all of this history uh, and its age, remarkably homogeneous. Um, there are not <laughs> major ethnic groups. There's not, not an equivalent of the Kurds in Yemen. Uh, they're Arab. Maybe different parts, but they're Arab. Um, there are not linguistic divisions. There are certainly regional accents and everything else. We have those too. Um, but you don't have the ethnic linguistic divisions that typify certainly Iraq, Afghanistan, um, and some other parts of the world, parts of the region that are very badly split. And at least up until recently, and we'll talk about this in greater detail, it does not have a history of sectarianism. Somewhere between 30 and 45 percent of the population are Zaydis, which is sort of an element of the Shia branch. And then the rest of the population are Shafis, which are sort of Sunnis. Um, but if you kind of took the Saudi Wahhabi Sunni at this end and maybe the Iranian Twelvers at that end, the Zaydis and the Shafis kind of end up in the middle. Uh, they shared an awful lot of, of doctrines. They shared a lot of practices. Uh, they worshipped in each other's mosques. And so there was not a history of sectarianism. Um, it is, in addition to being the largest and the youngest, uh, the most resource-deprived. Resource um, it not only basically doesn't have any oil. Uh, in a country the size of Texas, there are no rivers, uh, no lakes, uh, no water resources 20, uh, uh, 12 months out of the year. They, most of their water comes from monsoon rains and an ever depleting um, aquifer. Um, and it's very hard to imagine this now, but way in the misty past, in the late 1990s, um, it was touted as one of the emerging democracies in the region. Uh, the first Community of Democracies summit meeting was actually held in Yemen. Uh, it looked like they were in a very idiosyncratic Yemeni way going to establish some kind of an indigenous democra democratic structure. Uh, they had a constitution, they had a parliament which functioned at least as well as ours, uh, which is fairly low bar. Um, they were a multi-party system, uh, there's women's suffrage, uh, civil society, um, a completely irresponsible press. Um, and the unification in 1990 had been negotiated. It was not a, new, um, a unification by force of arms. Um, and so for one kind of brief shining moment, 
uh, in the late 90s, uh, maybe early 2000s, it looked like Yemen might actually make it. Um, it was never going to be prosperous. Uh, it just wasn't dealt the kind of resource hand to do that. But it looked like politically they might actually make this thing work against all odds and all of the criteria of political science. Last September, um, President Obama, in his announcement on U.S. military operations against ISIS in Iraq, touted Yemen as a success and one of America's great wins. And even those of us who have worked on Yemen and have an affection for Yemen and kind of keep hoping that somehow Yemen is going to make this thing work, we were all baffled by that comment, um, that whatever Yemen is, it is not yet a success. Um, it has done reasonably well on political transition despite some overwhelming uh, challenges, but it was not a success. And if the President, ours, was drawing a comparison between what we were about to launch in Iraq, a concerted military action against a, a powerful um, insurgency, the parallel didn't work. And if he was claiming that our counterterrorism efforts against AQAP, which is basically a strategy of drones and some local partners, if he was claiming that that was a success, uh, the parallel didn't make any sense. If he believed that the Iraqi political transition bore any resemblance to the Yemeni political transition, um, then again, the parallel did not make any sense. Yemen's political transition since 2011 had gone reasonably well on a regional standard. There was a negotiated transfer of power. Um, the pre uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, the president, did not end up in jail. He did not end up dead in a culvert. Um, there was not the massive carnage that we see in Syria. Uh, and there wasn't even the repression, repression which continues to haunt Bahrain. Um, there was basically a negotiated contractual transition of power. Uh, the new president was affirmed by a referendum. I won't overstate, you know, that it was an election, but it was a, a good referendum. Um, they constructed a national dialogue, 565 Yemenis, uh, men, women, men, women, Houthis, youth, um, non-youth, uh, southerners, northerners. Um, they managed for a country that is actually very diverse uh, to get 565 people who reasonably reflected uh, most of the major players in the country. And for about six, eight months. They talked through a national dialogue and a new social contract. Um, and again, I kind of can, at, at one point they pointed out to us is that they managed to keep their national dialogue going, pass a budget, and keep the government operating when we went into sequestration and shut down our government. And <coughs> they've actually offered to come help us. Um, they enjoy broad range political support in the region uh, and internationally. And they've just promulgated a new constitution. So if you look just at these transition benchmarks, they've been doing pretty well. Uh, probably only the Tunisians are doing better. Um, but there were some major fissures and fault lines. Um, a number of groups that participated in the national dialogue uh, were excluded from the, on, from the next government uh, by the terms of the GCC agreement, most specifically the Houthis. The Houthis had been legitimate political players in the national dialogue, but the way the GCC agreement was set up, they were not going to have any role in the future government. Um, regional federalism as a broad concept was is generally agreed to, but not where you draw the lines. And if you can't agree on where you draw the lines, then the idea of regional federalism is, is fairly hollow. Elections were postponed because everything always takes a little longer than it should, but that meant that the interim government under Hadi was also extended, and his legitimacy became a little bit less clear uh, when he was unilaterally extended. I'm not sure there was an option, but you start having this fraying of the legitimacy of the various <coughs> political institutions. And most importantly, the economy just continued to 
either wobble or tank. Um, I will say that the drop in oil prices, uh, which is a whole different set of talks, is going to be very hard for Yemen. They, uh, they don't export very much, about 300,000 barrels at best, uh, which is about as much as Bakersfield. Um, but it's maybe 90 percent of their budget. And so when the price of oil drops from about 100 to around 40, it hurts the Yemenis very, very much. Um, even despite all these things, the Houthis remain marginalized. <coughs> the Southerners remain very disaffected. Um, and AQAP continues to operate. So the Houthis began to press their case um, and that the promises of the 2011 revolution um, had remained unmet. The political, the established political elites were still in power, deeply entrenched. Uh, the government, particularly the cabinet, was feckless on a good day. Uh, corruption remained unab unabated. Uh, the state was basically non-inclusive, and AQAP had been allowed to continue to fester. And when the Houthis really started to push on this, what they ended up doing is pushing on what was essentially an open door, that the rest of the country, at least the populous north, um, shared these views, that the prom and even in the south, that the promises of the 2011 revolution were unmet. Uh, there was great promise with the national dialogue. Probably the high point was when that concluded uh, successfully, but then nothing happened. It looked the same, and the Houthis uh, were excluded. By September, they had not only controlled most of the north, um, <coughs> and there is a, I'll completely confuse you on, on Yemen at this, this is one. In the old days, there was a north-south Yemen except they were east and west of each other. Uh, and Lower Yemen was actually part of North Yemen. So Lower Yemen was above South Yemen, and South Yemen was to the east of North Yemen. So once you kind of get that straight, you, you've actually understood Yemen. Um, but um, the Houthis started up here, and what they've managed to do is slowly mo move down into here. They haven't made it to our uh, to tomorrow, and they haven't quite made it to tomorrow, I don't think. Maybe they've made it to tomorrow, not to him. But they're kind of in this heartland, which is the most heavily populated, um, but it's still a very restricted, a very narrow area. They haven't made it into the south, they haven't made it into the Hadramaut. But they did kind of roll across Amran, uh, roll into Hodeida, which gives them a port on the Red Sea. Um, and in September, they basically took Sun off. Uh, and it wasn't even much of a fight. Uh, in fact, it was very little of a fight. Um, it was, as I said, they kind of leaned on an open door. And what a number of the things that they demanded, one of them was that this feckless, idiotic cabinet uh, be replaced with a cabinet of technocrats. And they managed to get that. And so those of us <laughs> who were watching Yemen are going, Okay, that's not so bad. Uh, the people who came in in the new cabinet were just kind of Yemen's best and brightest. Very young, very well educated, very technocratic. Okay, this is okay. Um, they engaged AQAP in a way that the government hadn't been able to. Hmm, okay. Um, they left the government intact. They did not oust the parliament. They did not oust the president. And basically what they said was that they wanted to strengthen the state from within and um, make the promises of 2011 real. So there was a sense of maybe this is not a bad outcome. Uh, they should not have been excluded. Their political agenda, to the extent that it exists at all, seemed to be something that was workable. Um, they were even, they even came, there was a MOU signed in the fall between the public sector and the private sector on an economic stimulus package for Yemen. And the Houthis actually came as part of that delegation, um, and a number of us met with the Houthi. We gave visas to the Houthis, and these people were openly Houthis, so there was nothing, you know, covert about this. So there seemed to be, maybe this is actually going to work. Um, 
It looked like, as always happens with Yemen, is that it wobbles and wobbles, and then just when you think it's about to fall off a cliff, it writes itself. And it never really gets fully stable, but it doesn't quite go off the cliff either. Um, where are we now? Well, we've got, again, constantly shifting alliances. Um, the kaleidoscope is sort of in hyperdrive at this point. Um, the Houthis are now aligned with Ali Abdullah Saleh, which is a coalition that absolutely befuddles all of us. Ali Abdullah Saleh, when he was president, spent almost 10 years, well, eight years, seven years, um, trying to defeat the Houthis militarily. Um, they're now aligned with each other. And what's not quite clear is are the Houthis using Ali Abdullah Saleh or is Ali Abdullah Saleh trying to use the Houthis? And my suspicion is it's both. Um, most people's view is that once this thing settles out and if the Houthis do retain some kind of role, the first thing they're going to do is, is shove Ali Abdullah Saleh under a bus. The, what is not known is whether or not the Houthis can pull themselves together soon enough before Ali Abdullah actually pushes them under the bus. So we're all kind of watching the buses very carefully. Um, what, this, what we're watching now is this, again, the kaleidoscope is moving. People are setting up positions, political positions. They get to the brink, they pull back, they negotiate, and there's some kind of a new equilibrium. We haven't kind of gotten to that new equilibrium yet. In January, what happened, uh, which really surprised everybody, is in a sense um, the Houthis who said when they were here in Washington that they didn't want to run the government, they wanted the state to be there, and I think, they're, I think they do want somebody else to run the country. They want to be kind of the overseers to make sure that it's working efficiently and not corrupted. But, you know, we don't want to be the state. We don't want to be the government. Uh, we just want it to work better, and we're just going to be here to make sure to keep pressure on everybody. Well, what happened in January is they sort of became the dog that caught the car. Uh, they had been chasing it and chasing <coughs> it and chasing it, and all of a sudden they had it. And they, as you probably remember, you know, Hadi was under house arrest. Actually, the prime minister was under house arrest. Not even quite house arrest, kind of house confinement. Um, the Houthis badly overreached is what happened. Uh, they had been leaning on these open doors. They had all this support. Um, and at least my view is I, whether or not Hadi's resignation was forced or not, he don't know. But certainly when the cabinet resigned, that was to call the Houthi bluff. This, remember, is a cabinet that was put in by the Houthis in many ways. They're the ones who insisted upon this government. And, you know, whether or not Hadi is there or he's a figurehead or whatever, they needed that technocratic cabinet to run this country. And when the cabinet resigned, they really were left holding the, I guess if I have to keep my analogy, they were left with the car. Uh, and no, no idea how to run it, no idea how to drive it. It was a bluff calling. We now have also the situation that the parliament has refused to accept Hadi's resignation, which if you don't accept his resignation, what does that do to the cabinet's resignation to Hadi? And recently what the Houthis have been trying to do is to get Hadi to renege on his resignation. And Hadi has refused to renege on his resignation, thereby leaving it with the Houthis. And again, if you're utterly confused, you're doing well. Um, about on Sunday, the Houthis gave an ultimatum to this conversation that's going on in Yemen, chaired by the UN, um, that if in three days there isn't some kind of a presidential council, in other words, if somehow the state doesn't come back together, and by that they mean basically the cabinet and the bureaucracy and maybe Hadi, if in three days this doesn't happen, the Houthis will impose it. Exactly what they would impose, nobody's really quite sure. Um, as a result of their ult ultimatum, almost everybody walked out of the talks. Uh, so exactly where we're going to be tomorrow, I don't know. Uh, you know, stay tuned on that. And in the middle of all of this, quite literally in the middle of all of this, the Saudi king died. Uh, and I was with a bunch of Yemen watchers on this day when Hadi was resigning, then the cabinet was resigning, and then the parliament, and then this and that, and then all of a sudden all of our phones go off and the Saudi king had died. 
And that, what we now have, is the largest, poorest country in complete flux and the richest country that is deeply concerned about the future of Yemen but generally is not constructive on the future of Yemen is now in its own ambiguous and high flux uh, situation as even though there is formally the succession, you can be well assured that there is chaos going on underneath. We have a vacuum. The Houthis can't manage this place on their own. The Saudis may or may not be willing to support. Um, AQAP is still there and the economy is still tanked. Uh, Yemen is running out of options and so are we. Um, from our point of view, we cannot see Yemen slow, so, solely through the prism of AQAP. Um, in many ways, AQAP is the smallest problem in Yemen. It may be the biggest problem to us, but it's one of the smallest problems in Yemen. We cannot play into the Saudi narrative that this is all Iranian meddling. It's not. These are indigenous, national, native issues. <coughs> Um, and it would be a mistake to think that the Saudi endgame in Yemen um, is the same as ours or actually even the same as the Yemenis. It's going to remain fluid. It's going to be proxy fights. And I wish I could tell you that if I turned on my phone at this minute, everything I've just said would still be valid um, or if it hadn't just completely turned on its head again. With that really fast overview of 4,000 years of complex Yemeni <coughs> history, politics, and social dynamics without getting too much into the uh, theological, um, I will now open it to questions. <coughs>